Tonight we have our last topic, which is organizing an expedition. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about the field sessions, hit some leftover questions. And Aurora had a question on email last night that I didn't get to. Uh, I figured I'd just talk about that in class because it's a really good topic. Uh, and just hit last kind of burning questions that people are having as we head sort of out of the classroom and into the field session portion of the class. Uh, and then again, if, if there's time and people are interested, we'll, we'll throw out some more cool pictures of climbing expeditions just to remind us all of why we do this stuff. Uh, so before we get to all that, though, we will go to Organizing an expedition. So you've taken this class, you've gotten out and practiced, you're raring to go. So how do you do that? Where do you go? Who do you go with? What do you take? How does this whole thing work? That's kind of tonight's topic. And some of the things that I think about going into uh, planning a climb. Um, so first off, courtesy of Shu, I like this. Why do mountain climbers rope themselves together? Presents the same ones from escaping. <laughs> so, um, so part of the goal is, of course, to find people equally crazy as yourself uh, as we're doing climbing. Okay. So start off with the basics of any expedition. How are you getting uh, yourself on an expedition? Uh, one is be thorough. Uh, you can't, well I guess you can, but it, it's really hard to over plan. Um, you get better as things go along, but on a typical trip I'll have my stuff laid out a week or two in advance and I'll have, com I'm not a compulsive checklist person and I'll have compulsive checklist stuff uh, because it's really important that you plan everything and plan for different contingencies and what could possibly go wrong. And particularly if you're going to a third world country where the person who you've relied upon and sent a deposit to suddenly turns around and says, oh, wait, we, we need more money for this. Um, I've had several trips where you show up at the entrance to the park and, oh, no, no, the extra $10 here. And, oh, no, we've got to pay these guys more. And there's always stuff that happens. So the more you've planned, the better, more likely you are to be able to deal with the unplanned stuff as it comes. Um, know yourself. Know your team. Be honest with both. Um, that's the critical piece. Expeditions come down to the people on them. Period. Yeah, you can have logistical foul-ups, you can have weather foul-ups, you can have all kinds of crap go wrong. It always comes back to how are you and your team working together and dealing with stuff? That's what you got to focus on as you are planning an expedition. Uh, and the honesty part is tough. Sometimes you got to recognize and say, I can't do this, or I'm not ready for this. And you got to stand up in public and tell other people, uh-uh. A uh, couple of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make were when I was the guy <clears throat> who stood up and told my partner, we're not going to the summit because I can't. It sucks. And on the other hand, sometimes you got to talk to your teammates. And some of these relationships, short of a marriage, are places where you'll have to be as real in your communication as you can get. You know, I, I always joke that uh, in our training for Shishapangma, um, I probably slept with Mike more in the couple months before that than his wife did. Um, and, you know, but we got to a point we had to be able to talk to each other. You know, um, we had, uh, when I went to Denali, I was going, uh, it kind of 
odd set of circumstances. I'm going to go to that a little more detail later. But I ended up on a team with five guys whom I had never climbed with prior to training for this climb. So in the whole training process, part of it was getting to know each other. And I remember we sat on one beautiful fall day. We were just doing a nice acclimatization, you know, kind of get endurance run, get up a big peak. Um, nothing particular technical. Beautiful fall day. We sat there in the sunshine eating lunch and talking about what would happen when things went wrong. What did each of us look like when we got angry? How would that play out? And we had a really good discussion about that. And when we ended up having a situation on the trip where myself and one of my good friends um, wanted to kill each other, we were able to walk, because we had the basis of knowing what that was about, we were able to walk into camp and within about a minute, we were okay. We had to be honest with each other up front in order to do that. So that's the key stuff. All right, so determining a destination. What trip do you want to go on? Um, before you get to what, let's start with why. Why are you going on this climb? Why do you want to go on this particular peak? Uh, this is a really important question that people sometimes forget to ask. Well, I've always wanted to summit this peak. It's been on my list. I am want to get the hell to the top of it. OK. Maybe I'm really interested in this part of the world. And wouldn't it be a nice bonus to go to some place like Peru and get the bag of peak while I'm there? Maybe I've got this really cool new significant other who's a climber, and they're telling me that this would be a really good place to go, and I want to try to please them. Any number of reasons that somebody could end up on a mountain. You've got to figure out what yours are. Because when it comes time to pick partners, you've got to know what theirs are. Uh, run into a friend in the CMC. Uh, you know, they had a, a trip to Aconcagua, which really had some interesting group dynamics. Um, and I talked to three or four different people on the trip after the fact, and I knew that everybody on the trip was kind of pissed off at each other, and I didn't know all the details. But you had a couple of people who were very summit focused, and a couple of people who were very focused on being tourists in that part of the world and bagging a summit on the side. And the weather got bad. The people who were summit focused felt like, we got food, let's hang for a couple of days. People who were tourist focused said, let's get the hell out of here and we've got a sightseeing tour and let's do the wineries in Mendoza. Why are you going? Because if you don't know why, then you can't talk with your partners about why they're there. Um, another good example, I have um, my friend Steve, who was on my Denali team. We didn't summit. Steve went back three more times before he summited Denali. On the fourth time, he said to his partners, said, I have an open-ended plane ticket. I am staying on this mountain until I am done. <laughs> And he ended up summiting after all but one other person on the team left because the weather sucked. And he just waited and waited and kept borrowing food from teams that were abandoning. And he finally got there. But he knew exactly why he was going on that mountain. He was not going to leave without the summit. Why are you going? Other things to think about. What are you ready for? Yeah. Is it time to hit a big technical peak? Are you up for a scary technical route on a big technical peak? Are you just want, looking to get up high and see how your body reacts when you go above 14? Um, what are you ready for? Big one, the US with our good two-week vacations. What do you have time for, including acclimatization time? Um, how much money do you have? Sadly, a limiting factor for most of us. What's your climbing style? That's another really big one. And if you're going outside of the country, uh, what's happening in that part of the world? 
how are you going to deal with that kind of stuff? You know, I, on my first trip to Mount Kilimanjaro, it was six months after our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania had been blown up. That was something to think about before I left on that trip. It was also a reason we got the trip at a good discount. Uh, but uh, one of the more interesting approaches to the whole time, money, and climbing style issue, uh, some of you may know Phil Wortman, who's a climber in the Springs, really top-notch technical climber. Um, he pioneered what he called the ninja style approach to climbing, which he always goes very fast and light. But he will plan like four different trips. He will watch the weather. And whichever one looks like it's got the best weather, he'll buy his plane ticket a day in advance and go there. Did that in Alaska last year. Left on a Thursday after work and took a four-day weekend, flew to Alaska, climbed a serious technical route on Mount Hunter, and was back at work Tuesday morning. And I asked him, I said, you know, what about the cost? He said, well, what's the cost of going on the trip and sitting in a storm for four days? Interesting, different perspective. So what's your climbing style really makes a difference. How much time do you have? I mean, I compare that to, I was in Peru two years ago. We, we had a 14-day 14, 14 trip, and it snowed for three days, so that 14-day trip, the three that we were attempting the mountain. It was perfect blue skies the rest of the time. So some things to think about. There are different ways to approach this. Um, and sometimes pop in for the last minute airfare can be the way to go. OK. So to put determining your group, uh, one of the things, you know, we have some different things. So you're going to go with some friends and your established climbing partners. Uh, that's always a nice way to go. Uh, CMC outings. We'll talk a little more specifically about that. Um, guide services. That's good. Go out and find people. We're in an online world. You know, you can go, I mean, locally there's 14ers.com. You can find partners for any 14er, but a lot of times people are looking for big trip partners on that too. Um, I know some friends who just through the American Alpine Club message board. Um, through the CMC message boards, uh, you know, we have, um, actually I'll put it as an aside since I was just talking to somebody beforehand uh, who didn't remember this. We do have a CMC HAMS Facebook page if you're on Facebook. And periodically put, people put stuff in there and say, hey, looking for somebody who wants to do something. Um, so sometimes you can just randomly meet people. Uh, and we'll talk in a little more detail about what are the pros and cons of that. Okay. Other thing, what's your travel style? Uh, are you the kind of person who loves roughing it? Are you the kind of person who says, you know what, after I get off the trip, sitting in a hot tub with a glass of wine sounds pretty good. Um, those are some... Those are some differences, different approaches to take. I remember when uh, Chris and I went down to Bolivia. For the whole planning process, Chris was on me. Are we really going to spend the money for a cook? You really think we need a cook? We can cook ourselves. We you know, remember these discussions. And because Chris is one of the few people in the world who's even cheaper than I am. Um, and I was like, Finally, I sold him on it. I said, Chris, if we have a cook, there's going to be somebody in base camp with a financial interest in all of our gear being there when we get back. So he said, all right, finally, there. Um, day one, we get our tent set up and turn around, and there's Jorge, our cook, with afternoon tea and cookies. And Chris looked at me and said, maybe, maybe a cook's not a bad idea. Um, so. How are you going to go? Um, but you know, one of the nice things in South America, you can stay in a five-star hotel pretty cheap. You can also do a one-star one hotel for next to nothing. So how are you going to do it? Um, it is possible to take public transportation. 
particularly, you know, you go to Europe, you can put a lot of stuff on the train. Um, you know, I've got this trip to the Alps going in July, and we're going to get to the airport, we're going to get on a train, and we're going to get on a bus, and we're going to walk. And there's no need to hire anybody. Um, sometimes it's good to hire if you don't want the hassle. You know, uh, some of the trips I've taken to South America, we had enough Spanish speakers, or at least something approaching Spanish speaking in the group, that it was no problem to get to the airport and flag a taxi and negotiate and get to a hotel. Um, on other times, when you got a big group and you got a lot of gear, you know, hire somebody in advance to meet you there with a van. Uh, so those are all things that you want to think about as you are de determining your travel style. Okay. So some resources. If you want to do some research, where do I want to go? Um, and who else has been there? Where are their trip reports? Uh, one of the nicest things, unfortunately, the CMC withdrew its partnership. We, we started this library together with the American Alpine Club, and we're no longer a partner in it. But you can still walk into it. It's in the CMC office up in Golden. Uh, if you've never been, uh, it's a great library. You can find some of these historic uh, American Alpine journals. Uh, you can find old um, first-hand trip accounts from some of the first uh, ascenders of peaks. Uh, the people who work there, my experience when I've researched things, really know their stuff. Um, and they get excited when somebody comes in and wants to research. You know, this guy, I was researching Shishapangma, and this guy's going into the rare books room and finding me a first-hand account of the first American ascent, and he was excited. Um, and if you're a member of the American Alpine Club, you can actually, you know, if you're in the Springs, you don't want to go to Golden. If you know something you're looking for, you can send them an email, and they'll send it to you. Um, I remember I had some guidebooks that I took down to Peru with me, uh, and disappeared for a month and a half, and I was emailing, I re renewed them online from down in Peru. Um, and they were fine with that. Uh, so that's a really good resource um, to check out if you're up in Golden, worth walking around. And just if you like old books and stuff, it's fun. Uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get there in a second. Um, South American Explorers. If you like South America, uh, saexplorers.org. I'm not currently a member. If I spend any length of time in South America, I usually renew. Uh, they have clubhouses in some key cities. They've got a Buenos Aires clubhouse. They've got a Quito clubhouse. Um, they've got a Cusco clubhouse. They've got a Lima clubhouse. And if you go to the clubhouse, you've got people there who know the area, are willing to talk to you. They'll do gear storage. They'll take shipments for you. Um, it was a great place when I was in Cusco. That's where I went to research which peak do I want to climb and what outfitter do I want to go with. Um, I had people who knew. And they had a climbing partners board. Unfortunately, I didn't find one, but that was some place to go. Uh, their website has all kinds of trip reports, all kinds of reviews of outfitters. If you're rolling the dice on an outfitter in a country where you don't know anybody and where there may or may not be any good, it's always nice to see a good review. So they have, they have a lot of collected reviews on various people. Um, they also, you can get discounts. I know my Spanish language school gave me a 10% discount or something because I was in the South American Explorers at the time. Um, so that's a pretty good organization. Okay, web-based resources. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Um, there's just climber.org still maintains some high altitude lift serves. Um, there's also um, things, you know, like the 14ers.com or their equivalent, the summit post type of things that'll post trip reports. Uh, there's guide service websites. I absolutely love stealing itinerary, in, itineraries and clothing lists from guide services. Um, it's a great, because it, they'll have something that I forgot, or at least they'll give me a starting place for how long is it really going to take me? 
Where are the camps on this peak? If you're going to something well known that's guided, why not steal their information? Um, the U.S. Park Service, if you're going to some place like Rainier and Denali, uh, both of those have pretty good websites. Um, and when you go to Denali, you check in with the climbing rangers and they'll give you the latest beta. It's really nice. Uh, you also want to look at the State Department's travel page if you're worried about what's going on in the world. Okay, are you going to go taking climbing trips to northern Iran? Might be kind of some really cool mountains in northern Iran. I don't know that I'm going to go there right now. But figuring it out. What is safe? And of course, knowing that travel warnings are just that. There are travel warnings. You know, when you read some of those things, you think, if I was somebody coming from Germany, what would it say about New York City? And how different is that from what I'm reading about this city? So you have to take all of these things into account and then your experience and talk to people. Um, sometimes you just put it in a Google search and say, okay, let's see what else I can find about this peak. Uh, the nice thing about the web stuff is there's so much stuff out there. Um, the rough thing is there's so much stuff out there. And if you have any experience with going on 14ers.com, because that's an easy local one where you get lots of different stuff, one of the first things I always ask when I read a description or I read a conditions update is who wrote it and what was their level of experience? Because I remember reading something before, what was it? Um, I was going to Chicago Basin. I was reading a recent trip report and this guy went in a whole paragraph on the traverse between Aeolus and North Aeolus and how sketchy it was and how he was gripped and how it was the most scary thing he'd ever done in his life. And I walked across it and wondered what he was talking about. So he was somebody with different level of experience and different level of comfort. So unless you know the person writing the report, you got to take some grains of salt with what you're seeing out there on the web. Um, that's an important thing to remember. Okay, uh, last the American Alpine Club. Uh, this is, I seem to go through cycles of letting mine lapse and then getting it back and then letting it lapse and then getting it back. Uh, but they have a lot of discounts on huts in the US and they've made agreements with certain European hut associations so you can get a discount there. Um, if you're going someplace, uh, let me think of where, where some good local huts are. Um, Grand Tetons, uh, there's a climber's hut there that the AAC gets you discounts on. Um, they also have a lots of re trip reports. Um, the Alpine Journal, at least going back 50 years, is online and you can search it and there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Um, you also, if you remember, you get the annual accidents in North American mountaineering. I love to read that so I can read what everybody else did wrong so I don't have to. The other thing is they give you accident and evacuation insurance. Um, and it's changed a little bit. It used to be that you had to call, their, they contract with Global Rescue. I think they fixed it where it used to be had to call Global Rescue first, no matter what was going on. And now it's like, OK, you can get the person to safety and then call Global Rescue and get reimbursed. Um, so they've fixed one of the big drawbacks with that. Uh, but the nice thing about them is their insurance allows you to be a technical climber. If you go looking at anything that your tra local travel agent sells you or an online travel insurance thing, that'll protect you for trip cancellation. As soon as you either cross the 4,000 meter threshold or put on a rope, you are off their insurance. They will not cover you if you read the fine print on any of the sort of basic stuff. So the basic ones are really great if you're worried that your flight's going to get canceled, you've got something going on and you're, oh, I don't know if, you know, I had one trip where my parent, I had a very ill parent, and I was like, all right, I'm going on this trip, but I'm buying the insurance because there's a chance that I won't be able to go or that I'll have to be able to, or I'll have to leave and return to the States. So that was the one time I actually bought it. Um, 
but there are a lot of other times where you might think about it. It's usually fairly reasonable if you're putting down a lot of money on the trip and suddenly you can't go. Um, it's something we recommend on all CMC climbs. Uh, but the AAC will definitely give you um, bang for your buck. Other thing, word of mouth is always good. If you hang out with a lot of climbers and start saying things like, wow, I'd really like to climb something this summer. You know, I was thinking about South America. Anybody else you know of going to South America and all of a sudden you're on a trip? I've had that happen to me with, you know, God, I'd love to get back to Alaska. And I was at a CMC event up in Golden and I'm talking to the guy standing, we were both standing at a hams table. And the next thing I know, the guy over at the BMS table, I'm getting introduced to him and he's telling me all about his trip to Alaska that's going in a couple of months and they need another guy. And, you know, I had never met him, but I had climbed with people who had climbed with him. So next thing I know, I'm going to Alaska. Um, so it's amazing what can happen with the networking, especially in a club like this. Okay. So a little more about some of these different ways to go. CMC outings. Um, some big advantages of the CMC outing. Uh, one is price. Um, you don't have to organize it yourself. The trip leader does that. But you pay only a little more than going on your own because really what you're doing is you pay a little extra to reimburse the trip leader for their expenses. Um, so it is much cheaper than going on a guided trip. Depending on the circumstance, um, it can be from, you know, moderately cheaper to, wow, this is cheaper. I know our last, our, our Kilimanjaro trip, uh, I went on a Kilimanjaro trip with the CMC, and my trip was four grand, including airfare, and REI Adventures was advertising the same trip for 7,500 plus airfare. That was significant. Um, when it, it depends a little bit on the style. You know, when I go, I, I usually do not hire a guide to help with the climbing. Some trip leaders choose to do that. Um, so that keeps it cheaper. I, you know, I went on this trip to Peru. We had two weeks in Peru, um, including a, climbing a major peak, including seeing some tourist attractions and, and all kinds of logistics and a cook, uh, 1,100 plus air. On a guided situation, that's a three or $4,000 trip. So the CMC will save you some money. Um, and the other nice thing is you develop relationships with people. Um, I wound up on the Denali trip I did, uh, even though I didn't climb with the people I knew, there were three or four people I knew who I had been on CMC trips who all knew that, hey, Greg's somebody who might want to go on Denali, and so they contacted me, and I got involved with this whole group thing. Um, so that's really nice. And I'll tell you, you know, just one of the reasons I've stayed in the club as long as I do, most of my best friends are people I know through the CMC, because a lot of my friends are climbers. Um, if you can do the pre-trip preparation, that again gets back to the know yourself, know your partners. Um, if you're on a CMC trip, you train together. There's usually three or four training trips together. There's a pre-trip meeting. Um, and then after you get back, if you like some of those people, you get to climb with them some more. And that's a really nice thing. Some disadvantages. Um, sometimes you get leaders who like to go places that are new. Um, you know, I'm leading a trip in July to Switzerland, and I have been to the hut where we're going to stay, and I've looked at all the mountains that we're going to climb, and that's all. So you've got to trust that the leader has got at least a modicum of skill to get you to the top. Um, you also have to know that the leader really does have climbing skills. One of our um, most consistent HAMS leaders over the years, and he will tell you this himself, is not a very good technical climber. He is a brilliant organizer. I mean, if I were to find a man to get me across three third world countries on a bus, I am calling him. If I'm looking for somebody to guide me up a peak, I'm not. 
but he knows that about himself, and so he usually hires a local guide to go with the technical climbing part, because he likes going, and he likes organizing, and he likes being on big peaks. And, you know, I think uh, this, he was a leader on my Kilimanjaro trip, and I think it was his fourth time on the peak, and it was the first time he actually summited it. Um, but he just loves leading and organizing, and he always hires somebody to take care of the technical stuff. Um, that's fine. Um, the other thing is what other skills are in your group? Do you have a first aid person? Um, who knows what? Do you have somebody who's really good at navigation? So you're kind of <coughs> limited to the skills that are there within your group. Um, another advantage, nice thing with CMC is people do come in from a similar background in training. You know, this class in the springs looks pretty similar to what Denver does, which looks pretty similar to what Boulder does. So I've had people from Boulder and Denver group come on my trips, and they know all the same things that I teach here. So we can kind of know that you've got a consistent level of training, and that's a pretty important thing. Um, going with a guide. Uh, this is something that I don't usually choose to do anymore, um, but there's a lot of good reasons to do it. So, speaking of, yeah, but I, it's kind of funny. I was just I, giving lessons to my high school kids on how to do good presentations, and I talked to them about, never put this many bullet points on a slide. So I have to correct all these things, um, I, or, or at least never show them to any of my high school kids. Um, too many bullet points there. Uh, but the nice thing about guys, you've got a professional who does it every single day for a living. That's big. They've been there before. They know the stupid little hidden things. You know, they might know that, God, if we hike, if we go another half an hour, there's a much better campsite that somebody who's never been there before is not going to know. You know, they have those kind of little hints. Um, they also have uh, just the expertise of being on a given mountain all the time. You know, if you're doing something like Rainier, I know I've spent time talking to Pete Lardy, who's a local guide, and he guides on Rainier um, and has spent summers up there, and he tells me stories about navigating in whiteout on Rainier. Um, I've been in one complete whiteout on Rainier, and it was scary as hell. And it was on about my sixth or seventh trip, so I felt pretty comfortable, but it was literally I couldn't see where my feet were and I couldn't tell when my feet were going to hit the ground as I was walking down. Um, and so he was talking to me about how he's figured out some strategies for navigating in whiteout. That's something he's going to get that I will never get on that peak because he spent every day for a summer on it. Um, so that's a really critical thing. Um, second thing the guy does is they take care of all your logistics, all your food, all your gear. So you're not necessarily bringing your own tent to get ripped apart in the windstorm. You know, that, that can save you some money in the long run. That's not a bad thing. Um, they can teach you some things while you're up there. Um, hopefully, if you've got a good guide, that's part of what they see as their job, is they want to make you a better climber. Um, you also, you know, I know uh, another friend in the club who, you know, he's taken this class, he's helped instruct, he's very good, very capable, and he was going down to Ecuador, and I asked him, oh, you know, are you just doing these peaks on your own? He said, no, I'm hiring a guide. Said, Why? You don't, you know, you've got all the skills. Why aren't you going by yourself? He says, because I have a limited time period and I want the summits. And this is the best shot I've got at the summit is to hire a guide. <laughs> Comes back to that first question when you're deciding on a trip. Why? Why are you going? For me, a big part of the why is I like a personal challenge. I like a mental challenge as well as a physical challenge. And that's why I still consider my trip up the West Rib on Denali the greatest trip I have ever done, even though we didn't get within 2,000 feet of the summit. Because there were six people climbing the West Rib that year. Maybe somebody had been out a week before us. But we had no tracks to follow. We had nobody else around. It was on us to figure out the route. And I love that. You know? I loved, uh, and one time Chris and I co-led Vernier, 
and we had snow and we had to root find in the middle of the night. And when, by the time we came down in the daylight, we were like, oh, that wasn't the best way to go. We could have gone over here. But we had to root find in the middle of the night and that was a blast for me. I don't know if it was a blast for all the students, but I, you know, I love the problem solving piece. And I'm a puzzle person, and, and that part works for me. That's why I don't like going with guides. I don't want somebody to tell me where to go and what to do. And I'm willing to sacrifice the summit in order to get the other stuff. But that's my why. If you're going on a trip with me, I'll talk to you about that. If you're going on a trip with me and it's a graduation climb for this class, I might have a, I have a different, one, different reason for being there. If you're hiring a guide, uh, thinking about this country, thinking about Europe, more sort of the Western standard, you, you're gonna have somebody, you're gonna want somebody who's AMGA certified, American Mountain Guides Association, or IFMGA, International Federation of Mountain Guides Association, or something close to that. Um, it's getting to be standard practice in the US that everybody's got AMGA certification. However, um, what it takes to be a guide in the United States of America is the ability to print a business card. So ask them, do you have a certification? If so, what is it? It takes a while to get a full-blown AMGA certification. I mentioned Pete. I think he worked on it for four years about, something like that. Yeah. I and mean, that's a fairly, fairly short amount of time, and he's really good. And he was doing it full time for a living. He owned a guide service before he actually got certified. It was easier for him to buy a business than it was to get certified. Um, so it's a long process, but you want to know that. Uh, if you're going to some place like South America, you're going to some place like Kilimanjaro. Um, Running into a cert fully certified guide is possible. Ecuador is pretty good. They work with the French Alpine School to train all their guides. Um, so usually you get some good people there, probably Peru pretty good, but sometimes you're gonna get some sketchy people with no training. Um, the other thing that's very rare, uh, and this was about seven or eight years ago, I ran into some folks I was taking a first aid refresher from, and they had just gotten back from teaching the very first wilderness first aid class ever taught in the country of Ecuador. So I know that when I climbed Osangate in 2003, we had one of our apprentice guides, who I spoke about when I talked about that trip, um, got pretty altitude sick. And the guide who I had hired came to me in the middle of the night. He said, so and so sick, can you come take a look at him? He was an expert guide. He had been on rescue teams. Um, he was part of their search and rescue. He had zero first aid training. And I looked at the guy and I was like, yeah, he's got pulmonary edema and we've got an oxygen bottle over there. Let's get him on it. You know? But so that's something if you're going outside the West, really check that first aid thing because um, it might be you. Hmm. All right, and last but not least, oh, sorry, not to go in with friends yet, some disadvantages of guides. Um, this one, I, I have a few control issues, so besides liking to challenge myself, I like to be in charge. Um, or at least have, I don't want somebody telling me, stop and pee now. Uh, you know, some of the guides get a little over the top. Uh, no control over climbing partners, um, and no control over your itinerary. Big thing, how do they screen? Yes, there are guide services that screen their climbers by their ability to possess a credit card that clears. Yes, that exists. Um, it's a sad stereotype and it doesn't, it's not as prevalent as you might be led to believe, but it does exist. Um, so you might be all well and good and the guy who they picked to go with you might not be able to make it. Um, you know, even just thinking about if you want to go up something like Rainier and you go higher R RMI and you want to go up the Disappointment Cleaver, you might be on a rope team with four people from Seattle who, who came up to 10,000 feet for the first time yesterday. 
They might be perfectly good athletes, but you're from Colorado. You're going to walk at different speeds. So that's a big thing. Um, having the relationships with people, working out issues before the climb doesn't happen. Um, the itinerary, uh, you know, some, they're on a very set schedule a lot of times. When you're out there with friends, sometimes you're like, we got a weather break, let's push it up a little higher. Or we're all feeling good, we've got a rest day scheduled, let's keep going. Or on the flip side, wow, we just had a crevasse rescue situation and everybody's psychologically wiped and we're physically wiped. We don't have a day off plan, but we're gonna take one. And on a guide service, they may or may not have the leeway to do that. It can be pretty regimented and pretty mapped out. Um, and food selection can be trickier. Um, you know, if you have really specific diet needs, again, it depends a little bit if you're in this country or Western Europe, they'll pre accommodate a lot of different things, but in other places you might not get quite the selection. Um, and of course the price. You're definitely gonna pay more money for all the skills that a guide brings. This is the one I throw in. Having a guide is not an excuse for having skill. Um, what was Dave's last name? Dave who worked at Grand West, do you remember him? Paisley, that's it, okay. Dave Paisley, he was a manager at Grand West Outfitters, which if you've been, if you've been around the Springs for a while, you may remember, it was an outdoor shop here. Um, and he was also a guide. Um, and um, he died in Alaska, probably a dozen years ago now. Um, Dave was guiding two, cli two clients and bringing them down the mountain. And Dave went into, his crev into a crevasse. He was on lead and his two clients could not stop his fall and he, he could not get himself out. Um, his two clients were now three quarters of the way up St. Elias, 18.5 or so in Alaska and their guide was dead. They had to get out. How do you do that? You have to know what you're doing. If you're completely reliant on the guide, and you know, I kind of view the guide as this is the person who maybe gets me a little bit outside my comfort zone, but doesn't take me so far that I can't get out myself. Um, so think about the guide as sort of giving that bonus push, but not replacing all the skills that you need to have. Okay, going with friends. This is a wonderful technique. Um, so, you get to pick your partners, you get to pick your food, you bring your own gear, you know the gear, you've used it all the time, you know how to set up the tents. You've got a lot more flexibility, as I said, you can take that day off. Um, and you get that level of personal challenge and lowest cost. You know, and sometimes it just works out. I'll, I'll tell a little more detail that how I wound up on a Denali trip with five guys whom I had never climbed with before. It was kind of funny. Uh, there were several groups of people within the CMC and a few outside the CMC who knew people in the CMC. And there were a lot of discussions about Denali on this particular fall. And I wound up getting together with some folks. I was unemployed at the time. And I said, well, I got some time. I'd, I'd like to get involved with Denali and help plan a trip. Um, and there were something like 25 people who had expressed interest. And we were narrowing it down to some people wanted to do the West Rib and some people wanted to do the West Buttress. And how are we going to figure out all this stuff? And so there were about five of us who were very, very committed. And we got together and said, okay, we're going to take charge. We're going to organize this mass of 25 people into some semblance of a trip. And so the first cut we made um, was really easy. They said, all right, how do we figure out who's really committed and who's not? And I said, that's easy. Have them write a check and see who does. So we said, okay, we're going to organize this trip. If you're on board, send us 100 bucks. Good faith money. Our group of 25 dropped to 14. Boom, there we go, that was easy. 
Um, and then we divvied up based on who was interested in which route. And we had a group of people who wanted to do the West Rock Buttress and a group of people who wanted to do the West Rib. As it happened, um, my two close friends who had recruited me into this um, and I had been on several trips with, both wanted to do the West Buttress. They were very summit focused and were like, that's our best chance to get the summit. Uh, I said, I'm really interested in doing some obscure technical route that looks a little more challenging. So I wanted to do the West Rib. So I ended up on the group that was going on the West Rib. And this is what I call when you're picking out climbing partners. Math people in the room can correct me if I'm using the wrong property. I think it's the transitive. The order of if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Is that transitive? I think so. I had a math professor last class. He said, uh, he corrected me because I was using the wrong one before. Um, but if I've climbed with you and you've climbed with him, then it's probably I'm going to be okay climbing with him. So, uh, you know, I had climbed much with my friends Ron and Jan, and they said, oh, yeah, we've climbed all the time with Vern and with Doug. And so you're going to be with Vern and Doug. And great. And Doug had been climbing for years with Renault. And Vern had been climbing with Steve, who had also been climbing with Steve. And he had also been climbing with Todd. And sure enough, that's how we developed our group. Um, great way to figure it out. And as we trained together, we got to know each other. And we got to know the personalities. And it seemed to work pretty well. Um, so, you know, those six guys, I see some of them more often than others. Um, but if we see each other, we're immediately, it's, boom, we're back to where we were. It's a really tight group. Okay. Um, there are some disadvantages. You have to do everything. So, all the logistics, all the food buying, finding all the group gear, who's got what? Who's, got, who's bringing this? Who's bringing that? What are the, who put together lists? Um, all that stuff. Um, you're limited to the skill sets that are within your group. On that Denali trip, we, kinda, we got together and we rated ourselves. We were like, OK, Vern and Steve have the most experience on Glacier. If we get into anything really tricky in crevasses, we've got Vern and Steve to be out front. Doug and Greg have done the most ice climbing leading. So Doug and Greg are probably our best guys to be on ice leading. Vern and Renald have done the most rock leading. You know, so we divvied it up. And we figured out that no one of us had all the skills we needed to get up that route. But between the six of us, we did. So that's a really critical thing. Do you have the right skills? If you don't have them, do you have them in your group? Um, and other big thing in going with friends, you don't know what you don't know. So maybe somebody's been on the peak before, maybe not. Maybe you've got a really good trip report, maybe it's inaccurate. You know? Maybe there's a really good site just a little bit above you, but maybe there's not. So on some of the trips that I've gone with friends, I remember Aconcagua was a great example of this. Um, we had a great guidebook and we had all kinds of descriptions that on our side of the mountain had a campsite at 17.3. There was a campsite at 17.3. There it was on all the descriptions and maps. We couldn't find it. We ended up going all the way to high camp three days ahead of schedule, and one of our team members didn't make the summit because our acclimatization schedule was off. And on that summit day, that was the worst I have ever felt on a summit day, completely dizzy and not going well. Do you ever find that when you go with friends there, is there a little bit of the, the personality thing where you don't want to disappoint your friends, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, you, or, and you don't, or they don't want to disappoint you, so you, you end up either pushing yourself too far or you're not willing to say something like, hey, I don't mm -hmm. think we should go that way because, you know, you're friends and you kind of don't want to disappoint them and you have yeah. this other dynamic. And so how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that that's one of the group dynamics that can happen. And that's one of the things you try to talk about in advance and getting to know, uh, you know, it comes back to why are you going and getting to know people. Um, I've certainly got into that. I'll get into a little more with, with the Rainier trips where I'm taking them as graduation climb. There are at least two trips to the summit of Rainier that I would not have done had I not had a group of students who had paid money and flown halfway across the country to do it. 
Um, so yeah, I felt that kind of difference. Uh, I think, you know, I told the story back on day one about thinking about climbing partners. Our first Rainier trip, we, we had two couples, and, and one couple stayed together the whole time on the rope and in their tents and stuff, and the other couple, who happened to be Mike and Crystal, his wife, split up, and Crystal said, Greg, I'm on your rope. <laughs> and Crystal and I know each other very well, too, and there came a point during the trip where Crystal was very pissed off at me. And she let me have it um, pretty good. And you know, we talked about it afterwards, and we laughed about it. Um, but she said, you know, this is why I wanted to be on your rope. There's no ramifications if I'm pissed off at you. <laughs> you know, I'm not going home with you. It doesn't matter. I won't, there's no follow-up argument to have. Um, so that's part of it's knowing yourself and knowing your partners and, and dealing with that. And that's where I mentioned in the beginning the why of I have seen. You know, there's one half of a partnership that's very excited about climbing and one half of a partnership that's trying to do it to support their partner. And sometimes that doesn't work out so well on a big peak. So, um, yeah, I think those dynamics can happen and you hopefully can deal with them as they go. Um, and, you know, a couple of stories, I, you know, one of my closest friends and climbing partners, Roger Kilcoyne, who's one of our instructors, he and I went up to do Liberty Ridge. And I was not in as good shape as I should have been, and I was feeling horribly. So I was very slow on the way in to our first camp, and I was continuing to be slow um, about, till about lunchtime on day two, and we're sitting at the base of Liberty Ridge and getting ready to do the committing technical part, and we're sitting on a rock having lunch, and we're talking about, we really, if we're going to do this, we know we've got weather coming in. We've got to try to push higher than Thumb Rock, the traditional camp, and really so we can summit early tomorrow and get down before the weather comes in. And we're having this discussion, and I finally look at him, and I was like, and you know what? You've dragged my ass to this point on the trip, and you aren't dragging me up that, so I'm going to call it. And that sucked. But he and I are close enough friends, and we've climbed enough together that... He was okay with that. And, you know, it's kind of the United Nations Security Council. Anybody can say veto. <laughs> um, and it's hard. I've had to do that a couple of times with good friends um, and, say, and been the weak link and said, no, I can't go. Uh, but then I've had other people who said that when I was on the trip and I'm excited to go. And, nope, okay. So that's a commitment you're making to each other. All right. Okay, some group dynamics stuff, speaking of being able to talk to each other um, and all of that. So, you want to have these conversations in advance. How are you going to do your problem solving? How are you going to resolve conflicts? Um, are you going to have a leaderless trip? Or are you going to put somebody in charge? You know, the Aconcagua group trip I went on with friends um, we designated a leader because we had one member of the team who had been there before. We said, Jan, you know this mountain and we trust you. So if there is a situation where we can't come to group consensus, we are going to allow you to make the call. And we had that discussion beforehand. On other trips I've gone with, it's, you know, UN Security Council. Anybody gets the veto. Hopefully you discuss it and resolve it, but that's something to talk about beforehand. If you're just going with friends, are you going to delegate a leader? Um, personality traits and habits, those are good things to know about. Who has what goals? That's why I started with why. Everybody's got to have some sense of what everybody else's goals are. Um, pacing, how well do you keep up with each other? You know, that's an issue, I, again, I'll mention Roger, because he's a hell of a lot faster than I am, and we climb together a lot. Um, and that's a discussion we have. And the second time he went to Liberty Ridge, he didn't ask me to be his partner. He found somebody who was faster than me. He said, I want to go with Matt, because I think he and I go the same pace. And I was OK with that, because I know that about Roger, because we climb together a lot. Um, you know, on the other hand, there are people I climb with that I'm much faster than. And so, how are you dealing with that? On a rope team, you cannot walk at two different paces. 
So on some peaks, it's fine. I, you know, I mentioned my Aconcagua group um, gets to the last bullet. How do, and when do you separate? Um, if you separate. Um, my Aconcagua group, we decided it was a crowded enough peak. Um, there were three of us going for the summit. And we all had the little Motorola, Motorola walkie-talkies so we could communicate with each other. And we had stayed together to about 21,000 feet. And we said, let's go at our own pace. Um, and all of us were moving pretty well. You know, book time to get up from high camp on the false Polish route. It's like eight hours. And I was up in probably 7.15. And my friend Dan was probably up at, in 6.45. And Jan was ridiculous. She was up in like less than six hours. Um, we were all moving at fairly well, but at different, different paces. Um, I was definitely having issues with altitude on the last 500 feet. But we made a conscious decision. We talked about it. We had communication with each other. And we said, OK, we're going to go. And we're going to go separately. And, we're, and this is all right with us. You know, when Chris and I were in Bolivia, on the last peak, I had one more peak in me that he didn't have. And I decided to try a peak solo. Um, we had some communications. We drew up a plan. We made that work. Um, sometimes you just have rope teams working at different paces. Uh, trip to Ecuador a few years ago on a CMC trip. Um, we had a short section of fixed line to kind of get up onto the glacier proper on Ilanitsa Sur, um, which was no problem. But the guys who had gone up at first, the first rope team, it, we're standing there freezing their butts off for a half an hour waiting for everybody else to get up the fixed line because it just takes time. So I got a radio from the guy who was in, in leading the first rope team. He said, Greg, I need your permission to leave because we cannot continue to stand here. It is too cold. So we made a safety call that one rope team went out. You know, as each rope team got to the top of the fixed line, they went and we were separated for most of the glacier part of the climb. But we felt OK with that, because that was the safer call to keep everybody moving. So there are times that you might want to split up. There are times that you absolutely don't. How do you make those decisions? Again, it comes back to you. Do you have a leader? Have you talked about it in advance? What are you going to do? Um, you also want to think about you know, food, group, group food, individual food. Um, how do those things work? One thing I'll add in at this point, I haven't thrown a bullet point on it yet, um, because it's really changed since I first created this slideshow in 2006. Um, electronic devices and their impact on a group. Uh, I'm a big fan of Motorola walkie-talkies. But all the other stuff that we've got now with our smartphones, with our little Delorme things, with our spots, um, and how much communication do you want, do you need, and is a good idea with the outside world? That's a new decision to make. And you know, when we go on Rainier, yeah, I usually delegate someone to say, OK, who's going to carry the cell phone? I happen to know that AT&T is the service that works best on that mountain. So we usually pick somebody with AT&T who can't be separated from their phone for four days. I'm very happy leaving my phone in the van at the bottom. No problem here. Uh, and that person's our designated carrier of the phone because it's a good thing to have in emergencies. I, I'd be pretty surprised if it, within five years it does not become standard practice on every CMC international trip to have a SAP phone um, because of the risk of lawsuit if you don't have st what's standard practice. It's definitely standard practice in the, in the US guide industry anyway to have sat phones now. Um, but the spot things, the, the Delorme things, um, they're great in terms, I love it when my friends have one and I can follow them. I was looking at the Aconcagua spot, you know, the, the trip leader who's been down there this week um, had one. It, I was tracking the teams on Denali this summer. It's a lot of fun and you feel like you're participating. It's great for your family back home. They can see where you are. 
you know, I love it when I get back from Rainier and maybe we've had a spot on the trip and one of my siblings calls and says, yeah, I was watching you guys every half hour. It was giving me a new signal and I was watching you guys go to the summit and wasn't that cool. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff about them. If you get into trouble, you can send out your quick emergency signal. There's a flip side to them. Um, coming back to my Denali trip, we were doing, this was before the world of smartphones, we, but we had figured out we were doing a web broadcast. We had a limited text ability and we had a website and so we could transmit to a website. And we had set this up, mostly my friend Doug had a couple of young kids at the time and he said, I need a way to keep in touch with my family when we're out there. So I want to set this up and we had also promoted it to some schools and we had some people following us because we thought it would be cool to you know, do something for education while we're out there. Great. Um, it was kind of um, a pain. We had, you know, there were a lot of batteries involved and about three different pieces of equipment and those were split between three different people's packs because nobody wanted to have all the weight. Um, so it was a bit of a pain to do this. Um, so we had a couple of moments where, you know, we had just had a 14-hour day. One of our team members had had a crevasse fall. We had had to pull them out. We were mentally and physically completely exhausted. We had just spent an hour digging out a camp and getting ourselves some soup in us so we could fall asleep. And somebody would point out, if we don't do a broadcast, everybody at home thinks we're dead. The last thing in the world I wanted to do was a broadcast. So that was when I started to turn a little sour on electronics with me. Uh, that's something we had an experience on Rainier. Um, it was totally cool. We got up to um, Camp Sherman. It's kind of our, our main camp we go to the summit from. And ridiculous windstorm mini blizzard, setting up our tents in this crazy storm. It was a lot of fun. Um, one of the guys on the trip took a 30 second video and posted it to his Facebook page. Okay, right, cool, right? Yeah. His wife spent the next three hours on the phone with another friend who was a climber, trying to be convinced that her husband was not about to die. So, was it a good idea to do that post? You know, those are some things to think about. I have another friend who carries a spot. He did a lot of crazy stuff solo, um, and he carried a spot with him. He was doing a peek down the San Juans in the wintertime, and it's Saturday afternoon or evening, early evening, and I get a call from his wife who's on a business trip, and she says, hey, Greg, Mike's doing this crazy trip, and his spot hasn't said anything since 10 o'clock this morning. And I wasn't really worried or thinking about anything of it, but you know, his spot sends emails to his parents and my parents and everybody's calling me thinking he's hurt. What do you think we ought to do? So she was just looking for a second opinion. And we were looking at, and I knew the area he was in, I was like, there's a lot of high cliffs there, there's a good chance the satellite's just not getting out. But we ended up I was on the phone with state police who were running the search and rescue in that area and we were having discussions back and forth about what could we do and they were going to at least send a car to look and see if his car was still at the trailhead. Um, but there were high cliff walls, his signal didn't get out. And about an hour and a half after she first called me, his signal pinged and he was two miles from the trailhead. Um, so if we get too reliant on the technology, it can impact the people back home negatively. So that's something that really to think about because it's there and available and it's a nice thing and it can be a safety thing. But on the other hand, it can freak people out. So think carefully about your choices for electronics and how they might impact your group. Mm -hmm. You establish your main plan an ultimate plan, a contingency plan, um, a backup plan. I mean, how, how in depth do you go and do you document it and then do you communicate it? Like, 
communications to family members? It depends a lot on the trip, where I'm, where I'm going and, and what's going on. Um, usually, uh, people I'm with, somebody's got contacts with my family. You know, if I'm with, on a trip with someone, they've got numbers and contact information for um, various people in my family and, and key people in my life. Um, similarly, I would with them. Um, so there's that part. And in terms of backup plans, you know, it depends if I'm hiring logistics, which is one style I like to go in where I'll hire a cook or I'll hire a van or I'll hire somebody with a donkey to carry me in, but then I'll do the climbing myself. Um, I'll let them know kind of what to expect. You know, we're likely to be here on this day. We're likely to be here on this day. You know, you should get nervous if you haven't heard anything from us by this, this, or this. Um, there's always a balance. Uh, because a lot of my siblings are not climbers, I, I sometimes don't go into grave technical detail on what I'm doing. Um, I've often thought it's a very good thing that my technical climbing career started after my mom died. Um, because if she was still alive, I don't think I'd be able to do it because she'd be freaking out the whole time. Um, so I always have it planned with my partners. So, okay, here are our bailout points. Here's what could possibly go wrong. Here's what we need to know. Um, it, but how much of that gets communicated back home can be different. So last thing, the absolute best I have, advice I ever received uh, before leaving on a trip and I'll credit it since actually he's not here tonight, but I got this, um, my Denali team, as we were getting ready to leave, Mike had done the same route uh, two years before us, and we went to his house on a Friday night, and he gave us all his detailed lists and slideshows and GPS coordinates and the great compulsive stuff that Mike collects about trips. That's why I love him. Um, and so he got very invested in our team and going, and as the day we were getting ready to go on the mountain, he sent us an email with two sentences in it. Come back. Come back friends. Um, absolutely best advice I ever got. Um, so with that, we will, um, let's take about a six or seven minute break. Let's go, go to 718.